Hi guys, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this presentation. I am Jen Sorlane, I'm president of AVTE, um, and I'm super excited for this panel discussion. Um, we, Heather, uh, Lori and I, when we planned this, we wanted to do something that kind of, you know, ran the gamut in regards to education and kind of, you know, learn how everybody got here. And then, you know, ABT is always about learning from each other. And so, you know, getting tips on, on if you're new to the transition of teaching, or even if you've been in it a while, you know, again, and seeing, you know, what we can all do to help each other. Um, if you guys have questions, please feel free to um, add them in the chat box. We'll be keeping a, kind of keeping a tally of them and we'll answer them towards the end. Um, also feel free at the end when we ask questions, you're also welcome to raise your little animated hand and unmute yourself and ask questions that way as well. And then I'll turn it over to Heather. Hi, I'm Heather. I'm on the board of directors as well. And um, I'm the Canadian counterpart um, to this whole show. So. I'm going to start off with getting our presenters or our panelists to introduce themselves and give a brief synopsis of how they got into education. And since it's so easy to remember, I'm going to ask you, Heather um, Shannon, to start, please. Sure. Thanks, Heather Laurie. Um, my name is Heather Shannon. I'm a registered veterinary technologist in British Columbia, Canada, and I have been an RVT for 34 years and an educator for 16 of those years. I was doing my radiology practical exam and when I went through tech school and I remember saying to the instructor at that time, I wanna do what you're doing one day. And then I set up my life goals to one day be able to teach and uh, that's how I got into it. Hi everybody. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Shannon, would you like to go next please? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shannon Thompson. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited. Uh, my, when I might start with kind of being in the right place at the right time, kind of the story of my life a little bit. Um, at the time, I was working with my business as a veterinary employment service, helping um, and place veterinary team members within clinics way back in 2007. And I was invited to come to a focus group for the veterinary assistant program that was looking to expand at the Algonquin College and uh, chatting with the program coordinator for the vet tech program at the time. And the next week I got a phone call asking if I'd like to be a sessional professor starting in four weeks. And uh, <laughs> it was uh, definitely with both feet and it was the best experience ever. I would, uh, I really, really enjoyed my time. While I'm still not an educator at the moment, um, I think we're all lifelong educators. So uh, I had a fantastic run and did so many things. So I'm really excited to share. That sounds kind of like a typical introduction to teaching. Two weeks or less. <laughs> you start now. Um, Sam, would you like to go next, please? Yeah, sure. I'm Sam Guiling. I teach at the Vet Tech program in Hawaii. Um, I So like full disclosure, they gave some of these questions to us in advance. And so I always write notes to prepare. Um, and I literally wrote right place at the right time. <laughs> Um, that's what it says on my paper. Um, I grew up in Northern Minnesota. I spent four years in the Navy and then I went to vet tech school in North Carolina. And on a whim, I moved to Hawaii. I worked for a year in a hospital here. And then I started in the second semester. So the students had really only taken anatomy and physiology from a person who had a PhD in zoology. And then I like made a ton of the classes and built the vet tech program from there. So it was all very serendipitous, I guess, along the way. Thank you, Sam. Beth, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I've always loved education. And when I was 18, I was actually in college to be a music educator, but I ended up dropping out. Uh, I went back to school at 28 years old uh, to be a vet tech. And um, when I found out that my teachers were vet techs and that's, that's what they were, I knew as a student, that's what I wanted to do. And I made that a goal 
to be a, a vet tech educator and to teach at my alma mater. Um, there was a lab assistant position open. So I was working in general practice and took the lab assistant position. And then I was there, I want to say six months to a year. And then there was a full-time teaching position open. And I felt like it was just absolutely my, my dream job. Wonderful. Thank you. Brianna, would you like to close off the intros for us, please? Happy to. Um, I am Brianna Fraley. I am one of the newer educators to the vet tech world. Um, I've been in the field for about five or so years now, um, less than a year in education. Um, I kind of got into education via one of my favorite doctors I've ever worked for. She took on the program director role at our local community college and kind of just reeled me in. <laughs> so here I am. Wonderful, thank you all so much. Um, so our first question for the panelists this evening is, what challenges did you encounter moving um, from clinical practice to academia? Does anyone want to start or should I call names? This sounds like class. Um, <laughs> Beth? I, imposter syndrome for me was the absolute biggest challenge. Um, I felt like, how can I be here? How can I be doing this? Am I smart enough? Am I good enough? Um, I, I interviewed for the position, but there was still that nagging feeling in the back of my mind that maybe I'm not the right person for this, even though it was something I was so passionate about. So um, finding my confidence and um, knowing that I should be there was probably one of my my biggest challenges. And it, so it was, um, I was okay saying if I didn't know something. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Let let me look it up. Let's figure it out. I don't know everything. Education is is lifelong. So I was at least comfortable saying, I don't know. Let's let's figure this out together. And I think that that's a really important thing that being able to say, I don't know to students because they know that they can go on and say, I don't know as well. It's really good role modeling. Would anyone like to go next? Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I would say confidence too. Um, but I was in a program that didn't exist. So it was like creating everything, right? Finding lab space, um, making connections for animals, for hands-on skills, and really just kind of, you know, building that rapport with the veter the local veterinary clinics and hospitals. Some of the veterinarians were like, we don't need this training program. <laughs> and now, we, now they have like half of their team is graduates, right? But at, at the beginning, they were like, we don't need this. And I was like, actually, you do. Um, so it was kind of some convincing too along the way, I think was a challenge. But if you're, you know, thinking about joining uh, an established college um, and establish that tech program just to make sure you you know kind of lean on those senior faculty members to to gain that confidence because they didn't have it either and if they if if they're not willing to kind of guide you then they're they're bsing you because they were scared too when they first started <laughs> i like it brianna did you want to go next yeah actually to go off of what sam just said I lean on my co-instructors all the time <laughs> um, and kind of bouncing off what everybody else has said, the imposter syndrome, right? Um, everybody that I worked for thought I was going to do so great and I'm perfect for this. And, and then I got there and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. This was the wrong decision, you know? So definitely talking to people you know, gaining that confidence and reassurance that, hey, I can do this. And again, I, I tell my students all the time, I don't know the answer to that, but let's figure it out together. I'm very honest with them because the last thing I want to do is tell them something that's incorrect. <laughs> but yeah, kind of the same as everybody. Thank you. Shannon, would you like to go next? Sure. One of the challenges I had was I had been working in emergency referral and specialty for a while. And then I was jumping in and teaching radiology 101. <laughs> and I had to go back and relearn everything. 
uh, way back at the introductory level. So between radiology and uh, parasitology and, uh, you know, the introductory diseases of the canine feline patient, um, it was a lot of relearning and just going back and reviewing. So um, that was a bit of a bit of an adjustment for me um, coming from, you know, it's been a while since I've done general practice. So uh, that was a big that was a big jump for me. And I was like, oh, my goodness, how do I explain this? I have to re relearn it because by that point I was starting to use some other radiology technology. So I wasn't even using, uh, I could, you know, going back to what is an MA and kilovolts and why does it matter and all that stuff. That was that was quite a quite a jump back for me. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Yeah, absolutely. Probably one of the biggest challenges for me is I started working at a, I wanted to work at the university that was close to my home. And the people that were there had been there for 20 plus years. So I knew that it was going to take a lot to get into it. And I left the clinic when I had my first child and I knew I didn't want to go back to the clinic life. So then how do I set myself up to keep in, in the profession, not in a clinic, but not able to teach yet because nobody was leaving. Right. So for me, it was like, I knew that I didn't, I was struggling with the barking dogs and the, and the, walls not having a whole lot of daylight that kind of thing really bothered me and I'm very empathetic and I really struggled working in a clinic so then what I did was I I started taking things like um, courses on how to be a, a better teacher we um, we have some courses like that in Canada that you can do I started teaching girl guide classes I started teaching sports um, I took the professional um, uh, course for how to become a, a better trainer, things like that, so that I could put all of those things on a resume. When the time was ready, I could hand it to them and say, look, I've done all of this training I, I want to teach. So I knew I wanted to teach and I kind of set myself up for that. What I did was I actually went and I got hired on at a ranch and I worked as their livestock manager. And I absolutely loved it because I could set up stuff that in that valley where they didn't have a whole lot of veterinary medicine, uh, the closest veterinarian was two and a half hours away, I could talk to the people about um, creating vaccines and, and regimes and things like that. So I got to teach the public one more thing that I could put on my, my resume for when I was ready to teach. Um, so yeah, just having those goals, knowing I wanted to teach and then setting myself up for success when those positions finally came open. And they did. I got the phone call of we wanted to completely change our large animal section. And every time I would go to CE, I would say to the, the teachers, when you're ready to change, you let me know. I want to come in. <laughs> so I kept up all that CE and kind of put my name out there. And then they called me and said, there's a job opening. And I jumped all over it. Wonderful. Thank you. And Jen's going to present the next question. I... I, I just want to commend all you guys. I just love hearing all of these different stories and, and seeing, you know, the different backgrounds and, and where we all came from. Um, what have you guys enjoyed about making the transition to academia? Shannon and then Sam. What I loved about it was I was still learning and I kept learning and Heather mentioned what, you know, when I, I think most colleges or, or uh, educational facilities are the same, where when you're a new teacher, they have these courses that you take. Huh? Um, some of them are a little quick synapses. Sometimes they have a certificate available for educators, like um, teaching adult lifelong learners or something like that. Taking advantage of that and, and re uh, learning yourself was really engaging to me. And it actually, as a part-time professor in my college, it was almost impossible to get a full-time position. So some semesters I had a lighter, lighter load than others, but it, it actually led to other opportunities within the college that could help supplement me along the way. And I really grew tremendously. So the opportunity to continue learning for me was an added bonus. And uh, I just love that. So it was all about taking those opportunities that were there as part of that uh, larger faculty team. 
And I think even like right now I'm teaching an exotic animal class, which is not my forte. So I'm having to like bone up and really learn the material again from when, you know, and I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. So I think that's like, it's like you said, we're always educators, but we're always learning. Sam? Yeah, I am um, being in Hawaii, very isolated from, you know, there's not like, oh, there's a vet tech program two hours away even, right? It's a long ways away to the next closest one. Um, so I, the thing that I've enjoyed most over the last 13 years that I've been teaching is that I've, like, I know that I changed the game here. Like, I know that I improved veterinary medicine in this state. Um, because we now have a three-year hybrid program that reaches all of the islands. So it's statewide now, which is really nice. Um, I also started our Vet Tech Association and I also got legislation passed to recognize RVTs. So it's not just the educator component, but um, just kind of like raising the bar um, in general for veterinary medicine in our state. Um, and I'm really proud of my accomplishments and uh, you know, I graduates come back and visit or come back to teach even. And they're like, sometimes I still hear your voice in my head. And, um, you know, it's easy when you're in academia to kind of just get lost in all of the, you know, slide decks and quizzes and grading and, you know, to, you're just kind of like in it and you forget the, the impact that you have and how many, people that come through under you and learn from you and how many people they teach your little tips and tricks to. And it really, it's exponential. And the amount of animals that you, that you reach and help is it really feels kind of infinite, right? So, so don't lose sight of the fact that you're really changing people's lives um, by doing what you do every day in the classroom. Who'd like to go next? Beth? Yeah, I'll, I definitely, I agree with that. Um, that tech school changed my life. Uh, I have ADHD. I'm dyslexic. I had a terrible time learning. I had a horrible time in school. There was a lot of teachers that did not understand me and, and that didn't go so well for me. Um, as an educator, um, I looked at, I look at people. I, I still, it's not what they are when they walk in that door, it's what they can be. My influence, whether that's negative or positive, there will be an influence. And I wanna be that factor that helps individuals discover what they're capable of and who they are. I was terrified of needles. So when the first time I draw blood, I mean, I, I blacked out and everything, but it was something I never thought I could do. I never thought I was smart until I went to vet tech school. I discovered myself and I want to help other people discover themselves. And then I think about it's the, for me, it's the ground floor. Education is the ground. It is literally for some people, their very first exposure to the industry. If I can empower the, my students, if I can empower them, then that goes out into the field. And I feel like it's the ripple effect and that moves forward and empowers the field. And I feel like we very much need that in the field right now. We need coping skills and each other to, to lift each other up and support each other. And for me, that started in my classroom. And that started with me, how I handled situations, how I reacted to situations, how I reacted to their stress, how I interacted and treated my students. So it, it's so, for me, teaching was so much more than the academics. It was the experience and the self-discovery and what each of those individuals are capable of. That's so inspiring, Beth. I just, sorry, I had to say that, <laughs> but it's just amazing. Um, if you guys don't mind, I'll talk a little bit if about- If you go Mark. next and then Brianna's up next after that. Her that sounds great. Uh, for me, I love seeing that light bulb go off on those students, you know, as you, those ones that are struggling or shaking so bad to try and pull blood from a horse. And then by the time they graduate, they're pulling blood from a mouse tail. Like it just amazes me, right? Like I just love it. Um, I also really found that, that I really enjoyed 
the constant change. So I liked that maybe one day I don't have any classes and I'm working on PR stuff for our program. Or, and then the next day, maybe I'm teaching in the morning lectures and I have labs in the afternoon or it was constantly, every day is different. And I love that. I love that it's not, um, you know, the same routine every single day. It's, it's constantly changing. And, and uh, at the program that I'm in, we also have a, a shelter as well. So you still have the interactions of the large animals, the small animals and running the whole veterinary clinic on top of the schooling so it, it's really um, I really love that I also love the CE that we get to do and meeting all the people that are, are out there that are maybe creating cool models for the students to learn on or or uh, have found a really cool textbook and just to be able to interact uh, it's just it's just a wonderful profession of so many different things uh, that the possibility is endless truly and to be able to teach the students to think outside the box bigger than a clinic because there's so many things you can do. Brianna. All right. Um, same idea as everybody else, the light bulb moment, you know, um, my main class that I teach is the large animal class. And, you know, seeing somebody who's like, oh my God, it's a horse, get it away from me to, hey, I pulled blood or I held their head for a demo, like watching them blossom. It's just, oh, it's marvelous. Um, one of the other things that I really enjoy about teaching is when I'm not teaching, I'm at an equine only practice. So I'm still in clinical practice. Um, so it's really nice to get a break from the clients and then also get a break from the students when needed. You know, I kind of have that, back and forth, which is really nice. All right, Heather, you're gonna ask the next question? Sure. So our third um, question is comparing our different delivery methods that we can use um, for our programs. Do you have um, a preference? Did you want to start us off, Shannon? Ah, oh, that's, well, I, actually, I'm going to pass to let someone else start that since I haven't talked through the latest uh, scenario. I will maybe follow up at the end if that's all right. All right. Does anyone have a, a strong preference or does it depend on content? Beth? Depends on content and the length of the class for me. So um, the program I was at, and I am I'm I'm working in learning and development right now. Um, but when I and when teaching and I taught hematology, sometimes the hematology class was like two hours long. And you got to think about the people you're teaching. We're not typically people that like to sit. And the program that I was at, it's literally like eight hours of lecture, five days a week. So trying to get people engaged and thinking about different types of learners. So there's each person learns a little bit differently. So I tried to integrate different activities into all, all of the lectures or the material that in, incorporated ways that visual learners could learn. So I'd incorporate videos. Um, I'd incorporate see one, do one, teach one um, and discussion. So I'd have checkpoints in lectures so people could talk to each other. I would have sometimes physical games where we're labeling things like we're labeling the microscope um, or we're having uh, discussions also. So I would try to do numerous types of, of activities within a lecture. Um, and then again, depending on what subject I was teaching, it may be a little bit more, more physical. Have you done a lot of online teaching through your program? Do you, do you like it? It is COVID, so um, not really, I'll be honest. Um, it with my my thoughts on it is for what we do, for what we teach, and for our profession is a very physical. It's a very hands on profession. We have a lot of um, hands on learners. So um, during COVID, uh, if we're teaching a hands on class, we have people try to like grab a pillow for at least getting some of the hand movements down for restraint if they didn't have a stuffed animal. Although there's quite a few college students and adults that apparently own stuffed animals. So um, 
I, I'm not the biggest fan of, of online teaching. I do prefer in person. Okay. Sha or sorry, Heather, would you like to go? Sure. Um, at Thompson Rivers University, we have both an online program and an on-site program, so I can talk a little bit about both of them. Um, I'm now the chair of the program, and we have actually aligned the two programs. So the open learning program is a three-year program, and on-site is two years. We've aligned all the courses, so if we have a student that is struggling with the open learning program, they can come on-site or vice versa. If they fail on-site, they can go through open learning and then catch up and come back on site if they need to. So I am, I've seen, and our open learning distance has been running since 2005. Um, and we have uh, very good VTNE results so that goes both ways. We, uh, with the open learning, those students have to be working in a clinic as well. <laughs> so that's kind of a, a, a side thing for it. Um, what I find is a real hybrid actually seems to work, especially for those students that like to sleep in a little bit or the ones that learn much better in the evenings, things like that. Uh, if they can kind of help with their or work around their schedule a little bit, that is when they're a better learner. If that means that they have to watch videos outside of class time and then uh, write exams outside of class, class times. So um, in our program, we really have embraced it. And we are running them both similar as a hybrid is the best I would say. Um, the students that are on site, they definitely have their labs in that in person. Um, there are some lectures that can be given virtually or, um, or on site together. So in person. Does anyone have any input? that they'd like to share, Sam? Hmm. Brianna, you can go, you always go last, go ahead. <laughs> um, I'll be quick. Um, I haven't been teaching long enough to know what COVID was like, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> um, but my only input is all of our, at least with all the classes I teach, um, all of our lectures are online and then all of our lab portions are in person. Um, and that, of course, we try and keep a little bit of time for any questions that would come through, you know, relating to the lecture part. Um, but that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you. I think it takes a lot of self-awareness to know what you're good at. Um, and I think it takes a lot of self-awareness for the students to know what method they need to thrive. And it, it's unfortunate that sometimes, you know, you get halfway through one of the online programs to realize like, oh, no, this is not for me. I should have gone to a brick and mortar school. Um, so I think probably as a group, we, we, AVTE and all of the vet tech programs could do a better job of, you know, helping, helping incoming students identify what's going to be the best situation for them. Um, we have a two year face to face program that's, you know, students are on campus most days of the week. And then we have our three-year hybrid program where students have to work at least 20 hours a week, and then they come to campus for their hands-on skills. Um, the students on our neighbor islands don't have a choice, you know, they unless they want to move over to Oahu for two years. Um, but I, you know, I I think right now one of my like biggest worries about the fully online program, and I know some of you guys teach in them, is that we're really relying on an already taxed system to do the hands-on skills, which is a struggle for me to kind of see. Um, you know, doing all those videos is really challenging. Um, so I think just making sure that people are super aware up front what they're getting themselves into before they start this process, um, and that they have the support in place because a lot of veterinarians are like yeah sure sounds good we'll get you an education and then when they are into the video stage they're like uh we can't support you doing this so a lot of students start these online programs and then never make it through because it's so challenging and if you're working in small animal like how do you get your large animal videos done and without the support there um it can be a real challenge for the students so just i think um you know our preference isn't isn't the most important thing. I think it's like, if you know that you're good at online teaching, then awesome, do that. And if you know like, oh, this is not for me, then don't do it. Um, you know, just do a semester and be like, well, <laughs> that was terrible. I definitely need to be in the classroom. Um, and then stick with what you're good at, you know? And if you 
can maintain that relationship with your students through an online format. If Zoom works for you, if some kind of like what feels like social media platform works for you to be able to truly check in and, and maintain that relationship, then that's awesome. And some students thrive in that scenario, right? Like, yes, I can, you know, hammer out these videos and I got this. Um, but I just, I just think like being honest with them is the most important thing about, about what it's really going to take to be successful with whatever modality you're using. Thanks, Sam. I think that's a great way to end this question. So, and Brianna, I'm sorry, because you see how you just started teaching last semester. So this isn't necessarily applicable. But um, so those of you guys that did experience changes due to the band, uh, due to the pandemic, what did you guys find beneficial and what have been more detrimental? Kind of piggybacking off the last question. Sam. Can I segue from my last answer? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so for sure the tools, right? There's like tons of tools were created or at least brought to the forefront of like, oh, wow, I didn't even know that this thing existed. And that's awesome, um, right? These digital whiteboards and all these things that, that we would have never, may not have never used um, if we weren't, if the if our hand wasn't forced, right? To, to all stay at home. Um, Another one is for sure virtual CE. Living in Hawaii, I was like, oh, I always had like FOMO, right? Like, I just want to go to one of those big conferences. Like, it's so expensive just to get there, you know, and it was really hard to travel all the time. But like, all these conferences went virtual. I was like, I, I never did more CE <laughs> in my life. I was like, I was like, I was like I'm going to sign up for this. I'm going to sign up for this. And some of them are free. I'm like, sweet, I'm going to do it. Um, so that was for sure um, a silver lining for me. I think I also in some ways was able to make more connections throughout vet med because of you know the force the forced digital scenarios um i did a lot more networking that way i think one of the biggest that's you know double sided is um mental health for our students um a lot of my students really struggled during covid and you know i would put up one of those tools and I would say just, you know, anonymously, like, how are you doing? And some of them had anonymously, but in front of the class, right? Some really hard things that they just put out there. And I was like, I don't know which one of you this is, but like, we're with you and everyone is struggling. And so they were able to just kind of put themselves out there a little bit more. And it made us much more aware, or at least I don't know if the other faculty in my program did that, but me far more aware of some of the struggles that they went through during that time, you know, having to support some of their young younger siblings going through school, right? Because their parents are trying to work and, you know, they're like, well, I got my little brother in sixth grade and I got to help him do his stuff. And, you know, there was a lot, just a lot. And I think just bringing that to the forefront a little bit helped veterinary medicine as a whole. Heather? Sure. Thanks. Um, so some of the things that I think really helped uh, with during COVID was learning how to be flexible and learning how to think outside the box. Like we were just kind of thrown into it. And so, uh, you know, we had to, to think about how we could get our lessons across without being in the same room. And, and like Beth already talked about, you know, using stuffies or, or having them hold their own critters if they had them and helping each other, you know, it was, it was a very, a very trying time. One of the good things that we've learned about is telemedicine, you know, being able to use RVTs more to do telemedicine in some areas of the country is has been amazing because we've been able to bring back some of those texts that are like, I can't go back into the clinic or I'm burnt out or I, I can't leave my children now. They can set up a schedule outside of what might work for them better. So um, I think that that was one of the, the benefits from COVID is learning that there's other ways we can do medicine and there's other ways we can utilize RVTs. 
uh, or event techs, right? Um, detrimental for us as uh, speaking from as a school point of view, our budget was cut drastically uh, because they basically said, okay, you're no longer running a veterinary clinic per se. Um, so, and, and you're all working from home. So we're going to cut back what we give you to run your buildings, to um, look after the critters, all of that type of thing. And we have not gotten that budget back. So we're struggling with that as well. Um, so, you know, that, that whole budget cut back or, and they didn't know how long it was gonna last. So we actually had some faculty members leave and we never got those positions back, right? So, and I, and I agree with, with Sam as well about the mental health issues. And I, I think we're still struggling with that. I, I still see it in the students coming in right now. They, they are struggling. Um, they're struggling with body language, reading body language, working in groups again. Um, it's definitely, it's definitely still an issue out there. I think one of the, yeah, Beth, you're next after, um, I just want to say something really quick. One of the beautiful things that I saw come out of the pandemic was kind of when all the shutdowns happen was the Facebook group for ABTE and everybody coming together going, oh my God, I have to teach this online. What do I do? And just the sharing of ideas across the various programs was, it was just, it was like almost brings me to tear. I mean, it was just, it was amazing how we came together to say, how are we going to do this? Beth? Yeah. Um, I had, I was on maternity leave when the pandemic first hit. So I was watching Tiger King. That was my big thing. I'm like texting Paul, I was like, have you guys seen this? And they're, they're worried about the shutdown because they, the school shut down for maybe three days to adjust. Um, because the, the program goes year round, you can't stop. So as much as, as it was, even when I came back, I came back from maternity leave a little bit early. Um, it, I mean, it was, it was hard. It was, but there's a couple of positive things I think that came out of it, not just for vet med, but, but for everybody. One is the resilience that we have. Um, I think as an industry, we're extremely resilient in, individuals. If there's one thing that uh, people in vet med have, you know, we know how to get get back up and try to navigate different situations and make the best of sometimes not the best situations. The other thing is it did open the door to a lot more hybrid programs. Now, whereas I, I, I strongly believe online students, they need a lot of support, but at the same time, there's something there. Is it, are some of the online programs perfect yet? No, there's potential. And with, I, I feel, the staffing crisis, because there is, um, I did career services, alumni services. Um, uh, I was an externship coordinator, worked a lot with employees and a lot with our alumni. And with, with not having enough staff, you know, throughout the industry, these hybrid programs open the door for individuals to be able to work. Um, and have some decent support and get the formal education because I am a huge supporter of formal education. I mean, we're working with life and death. This is it, it. When I graduated, I was appalled that people off the street were doing some of the things that I was doing. Like you're just marking things down on a sheet for anesthesia, but do you know what that means? Like that dog's blood pressure is 20. Are you going to fix that? Or are you just going to anyway? But I'm preaching to the choir, but I, I think there are some really good opportunities that can help the industry the way it is now to have hybrid programs and partial online learning. And I do think COVID opened up the door for online learning and opened our eyes to online learning in ways that we never would have seen if it weren't for the pandemic. I also had a lot of students that stayed in bed and several that didn't put pants on learn that about students. <laughs> I was so happy that you were that comfortable in my class, but please make sure that you put pants on. <laughs> Anybody else? <sighs> yeah. I just I just hope that, that through the pandemic we've you know I I we've seen a lot and we've kind of known it, but I think there's still a lot of traditional delivery programs still that exist with three hour lectures and and that sort of thing. And I and I think it's now more than ever that the varied options and the varied teaching routes and methods are also not just how what's been dictated to us to, to deliver, 
but also that we really look at how the students learn and have the varied learning opportunities there and really allow that to happen, whether it's a personal learning strategy or whether it's a life, you know, they have to work or they have other commitments or whatever, to make them resilient and to, to create RVTs or credential veterinary technicians that are gonna be resilient to a crazy world uh, out there, we need to help them be stronger and advocate for themselves and have a voice. And I think if anything, we've learned through all of this that there are many ways of delivering um, content. There's many different ways to support students and that we really have to keep outside that box and offer that to our students and offer the learning and engagement so that they don't feel that I can't learn this way or I have trouble this way it means I'm not very good at it. No, no, it just means you, you learn this way. And that's okay too, because that we need that flexibility in our industry. We're gonna move on to something a little bit more fun for uh, this next question. So if you had to pick one um, teaching aid or tool to bring to a deserted island, um, and it can't be wine, um, what would you take? Uh, do you want to start off, Sam, since you're on an island? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yes, but thankfully we have uh, water and wine and Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, I think, well, I am a lab techniques nerd. So maybe like a solar powered microscope. <laughs> nice, I like it. Have you found anything with your microscope that you really love? Like, are there any hematology apps or anything like that that you find really helpful to you and your students? Mm, yeah, we have the like, I don't know what it's called. Like the touch TV thing that you can hook up to your cell phone. Smartboard? or whatever it's called I don't know what brand we have um that like so I have one microscope that I'm like just don't touch it like it has the little cell phone adapter thing on it for my phone like I can just hook it up easily I'm like don't touch that microscope and it connects to the thing so like whenever I find something cool I'm like I'm taking your slide and I'm bringing it to my microscope um so yeah I mean although I can't take that to an island I mean it is I mean to a deserted island but I could uh but yeah that's what i that's one of my favorite things to do is to just show them you know be able to show the whole class all at once it's kind of fun and because you could do it on zoom too right so sure. um beth do you have anything that you you love that you couldn't do without for teaching that, that would have to be a microscope as well that would definitely have to be a microscope. If it were a survival situation, though, on a desert island, I would bring the CTVT because there's so many uses for that book. If you got, it's like this big, so you can use it as a weapon. There's obviously medicine in there, so like you could treat yourself with minor wounds and 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 whatever whatever is needed. And I mean, this is terrible, but if you really needed fuel, there's <laughs> enough pages in there, but. My th I I'm a lab I'm a lab nerd as well I I love I love anything lab. Brianna, is there anything that's really been helpful to you that you'd want to take with you? Um, in a deserted sense, Swiss Army knife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for teaching, um, a cow halter, a cow rope halter. <laughs> I've had to put that on goats and horses. Um, I used it as a dog leash once, um, but that's kind of like the cowboy in me coming out. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Cows are my favorite. Then you, um, could, you could trap wild animals with it too. So it's I could to get food. Oh, like, so it serves yeah. multi-purpose. <laughs> Heather, I, I know that you want your Swiss Army knife, but what else would you like? 
I totally would take a Swiss army knife because I use it for everything. And I talk to our students about it too, like opening packages that come in and, you know, fixing things. And I am right with Brianna because I'm a large animal tech too. My, uh, my gut was like, I take my donkey Lola with her halter. So um, <laughs> that comes kind of through my brain too. Um, but what else would I take? Something that I also thought about my laser pointer, because then, you know, you could, you could actually use it to try and signal somebody to come get you, maybe start a fire with it, you know, some things like that. Um, yeah, no, that's my Swiss Army knife would be my first thing that I would take and, and I'd make sure I had some sort of rope with me too, because we all learn how to tie knots. <laughs> Shannon? <laughs> Sam just took it, that wrap. <laughs> <laughs> like duct tape of the vet tech world it is you can use for anything 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 at all yep oh, thanks um, for the laugh ladies so to all of you guys what are some advice that you would give to peers that are either early on in this transition or are wanting to make the transition to academia <laughs> sam Ah, oh, the biggest one is let your experience and your stories guide your students. That's what they need. I teach through stories. My students remember my stories. You need to talk. Don't just read them the PowerPoint. You need to tell them stories. It might feel like a waste of class time. It is not. It is not a waste of class time. You need to tell them how you screwed up, right? I, I'm just teaching hematology and I told them how I didn't know any better. And I put the phenobarb serum into the serum separator tube. And you have to make that phone call of like, I'm so sorry, you just drove 45 miles here. Well, 45 minutes, there's not that many miles here. 45 minutes here. And I put your dog's blood into the wrong tube and you have to come back and I need to draw your dog's blood again and put it into the right tube and I'm an idiot. And that's the worst phone call, right? Well, there's worse phone calls than that, but that's like a, I'm a super dumb person and I didn't know any better and nobody nobody said. So I'm like, I, so I show my students the IDEX book. I'm like, whatever lab platform you use, like it's on the computer now. If you have a new test, you look it up. You look it up, what tubes do you use, right? It's just that you help them avoid the mistakes that you made you give them the like, I wish I knew blank when I was younger, when I was first starting out, because although like they're going to make their own mistakes, they're going to screw up, they're going to do things that they shouldn't do because that's human nature, right? But they will respect you and say, oh my gosh, like, I'm so happy you told me that, right? Like if you can prevent them from making the same mistakes that you made, in addition to teaching them all of the stuff, right? Like that is so helpful for them. Like it makes you human to know that you've made a mistake and to be able to talk about medical errors, right? Like those are the really hard conversations that get even harder when it's like, your job on the line, right? So it's, it's, I tell them, I'm like, school is the place to mess up. Like, if you're going to screw up, screw up here, and we're going to learn together, and we're going to talk about it. Um, but that's the gift that you can give them is your stories and your experience. So that's really all I have to say. <laughs> Beth? Um, I'll, some of my biggest is reserve judgment. We all didn't know at some point, that's why they're in school. I think it can be frustrating sometimes when you're explaining something, explain, and they're, they're just not getting it. It's, it's not personal. Um, everybody learns differently and, and we all just didn't know at some point. And, and to look at the human and people, we see people in our classrooms I and mean, everybody's schedule is different. Like we saw our students every day. We were like a family, sometimes a very dysfunctional family. And there's always that black sheep. Usually that was me because I'm the, you know, I'm the instructor, but um, you see a very small piece of that person's life and you don't know what goes on behind closed doors. I would say we had students, um, it definitely in abusive relationships. We had students that were working and going to school full time and they were holding up the household and um, like financially and 
you know, sometimes their grades weren't, weren't that great. And sometimes, you know, the initial reaction may be to, to get upset with these people or why aren't you working? Why aren't you concentrating? Why aren't you trying harder? And um, I think we see a very small portion sometimes of our students' lives and to look for the humanity and help with solutions, things that may work for them um, to, to help them get through a program or a class and, and to nurture their, their passions, to encourage things that they are good at, that they maybe never knew they were good at and celebrate accomplishments. Um, I think that that celebration helps with motivation and um, self-esteem as well. And then that's something that goes out into the field. Remember to, to celebrate you and your accomplishments and encourage other people, other people in the class to, to celebrate others' accomplishments, even if it's small, because sometimes an accomplishment for somebody is just improving or passing a class that they absolutely hated or disliked. Heather? Thanks. Uh, you just have to be better than you were the day before, right, Beth? That's it. That's all you got to do. <laughs> um, you know what? I, I, I was kind of thinking of this question from the point of view of a peer that's maybe thinking of teaching. And I would say if they're thinking of teaching, just jump in and try it. You'd be surprised how much you know and, and, and your passion and your love for the profession will inspire others. So um, if you're at all thinking about it, just try it. You've got nothing to lose. So that's what I would say. Jump in. Also, don't expect perfection the first go around. Like when I think back, because I'm in this 15 years, when I think back to my, I'm like, oh God, I'm so sorry, you know, but <laughs> I've learned and I've gotten better, you know, and, and you will, um, uh, Shannon and then Brianna. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to follow with Heather says, you jump at it. And if the opportunity comes up with a course or opportunity that wasn't in your wheelhouse, it wasn't in your favorite list, um, or was it what, whether it's a clinical job rather than a teaching role or whether it's a course, you're not the big fan of jump, just go, just go start somewhere, anywhere. You are already proven to be resilient. You're already a credential veterinary technician, so you have the ability to learn. Um, so just jump in, go get there, get your feet in the door, give it a try, and you won't regret it. Brianna? Um, piggybacking off of what Shannon just said, um, when I first decided to make the jump into education, I was lucky enough to be handed the class that I wanted. <laughs> um, our program director specifically said, if you're not going to come and teach this class for me, I'm going to teach it because I don't want anybody else to teach it. So I know that's not the normal for everybody else. Um, but I just try to think back to when I was in school and what helped me, you know, the not feeling judged by either my peers or my instructors and you know just trying to think like a student again um one thing that i tend to do that i think my students like is i kind of go on little like tangents not necessarily things that are related to the topic of the day but like oh this reminded me of this one case i saw this one time that was really cool and I kind of, you know, dive down that rabbit hole and they always have questions. So then that's fun for me too, because I get to relive <laughs> that time. But yeah, just kind of remembering what it was like to be a student. Stop, Jen. <laughs> and then um, our last question for the evening. Um, does your organization that you teach at have any requirements for their um, RVT instructors other than being um, a registered or certified veterinary technologist? Um, I can I can say to that, um, no, they they don't. However, in 
where we are, the university that I work at, they really highly encourage, um, we have a provincial instructor's diploma program. So it teaches you how to be a teacher. And so they um, really encourage you to take that as well. That's really highly encouraged. And you also have to be a member in good standing of the provincial associations. So you have to, um, you have to be, you know, up on all of your CE and that type of thing. Um, the only other criteria they have on the jobs is that you have to have been out and working in the workforce for a minimum of five years. I, I saw a lot of nods with just being certified or registered veterinary technologist. Is that equal for everyone? Yeah. Yeah, to, but uh, to get started, yes. To hold a full-time position to get hired on full-time usually requires a higher level. Um, now, you, you have the fortune of being able to have a, um, a baccalaureate in the States, but we don't in Canada. Um, but they usually require a university degree um, to hold a full-time position in, in Canada. It, not, not saying all of them do, but the majority do. So sometimes that's required for a full-time position, but not always, but for the most part it is. So be prepared. <laughs> but there's a lot of opportunities if you don't. <laughs> yes, Rihanna. Um, at my program, and it sounds like a lot of the ones in uh, my state, which is Arizona, are similar. Um, you have to be licensed, certified, registered, um, and then you have to have at least five years of experience in the field and have graduated from an AVMA accredited school. Yes. Well, we are running at the top of the hour um, and I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so I wanna thank all the panelists, all the attendees. This has just been amazing. Um, thank you guys all for taking the time out and, and meeting with us today. Um, we, the ABTE Board of Directors is planning quarterly events like this. So be on the lookout and on Facebook and on uh, uh, the emails, um, but we will be doing stuff like this again. Um, if you've got any feedback, let us know if there's something that you guys wanna see in regards to programming. Call for abstracts went out today. So if you guys wanna talk at Palm Springs, please feel free, fill out the abstract, but thank you all of you guys, all you educators, y'all are amazing. And thank you guys for coming out tonight.